This is the best-selling bare bones server on Newegg, and it's powered by the best-selling server CPU on Newegg right now. So we bought one, set it up, and it has turned into one of my favorite server builds of the year because this is the entry point into virtualization dominance and saving bunches of money. So we have a lot to get into. Let's get to it. Hey guys. This is Patrick from STH, and this is the Gigabyte R113C10 and the AMD Epic 4464P. Let's be clear, these are far from the most expensive server CPUs you can get, but at the same time, they are absolutely awesome when it comes to building virtualized servers or just web hosts. We've been playing around with this thing, and I think you're gonna agree that this is absolutely awesome. Before we get too far, I have to point out that AMD has sent us processors in the Epic 4004 series that we have used in the system. Also, AMD is helping us because I said like, hey, let me just go buy a whole bunch of stuff. And they're like, yeah, cool. So we have to say that AMD is sponsoring this. But they also haven't seen this before it's going live because we're doing this editorially independently. Now in this process, we're also gonna show systems and components that we've just have in the studio from other vendors. So of course, you know, they're supporting this by extension. And the reason we're doing this, is I really wanna show that continuum from the system that we're gonna set up first to what it means when you go up the stack. With that, let's talk about how good of a deal these are. So how this all came about is I was up one night looking at Newegg and I just kind of had this idea. I was like, hey, I wonder what the most popular server processor is on Newegg. And so I looked and what I saw was this, the AMD Epic 4464P, which you can see right here is the number one bestseller in server processors on Newegg, at least as we're recording this video. And I thought to myself, well, hey, you know, that's cool, but what would we put that in? And so then I went to the server bare bones just to see if there was a cheap server that we could go and buy. And so that's how I ended up here. Now the Gigabyte R113C10, if you buy it alone, is about 630 or so dollars on Newegg on any given day. These prices change a little bit. And now with their new, you know, make an offer thing, like the prices are definitely changing quite a bit, which just, I don't really like that, but that's fine. Uh, and then what you have here is you have a combo with the server plus the CPU to so remember that like $429 CPU plus a $633 server comes down to right now it's $924. When we purchased it, it was $899. So it's going to be awesome, like under $900. Hopefully they do that by the time this video goes live. But all in all, I mean, you get a 12 core, 24 thread processor, all P cores, and you get the server that it goes in and it's not really that expensive. And of course, guys, I know you could say that, like, hey, there are mini PCs and all kinds of different options that you can go get. You get used systems, all that less expensive, but this is a new server and that's really what we're going for here. And so lo and behold, the server arrived. And one of the interesting things is it's actually on right now. And I'm just gonna show you really quickly here. You can see that this is now running Proxmox VE. It's actually very quiet, like under 38, 39 dBA at one meter. And so we can actually have it on if it's at idle. If we turn the VMs on, then it's a little bit louder. But at idle, we can have this thing running on set because it is not too loud, which is absolutely awesome. And that kind of gets me to the point, which is what this server offers and how you can configure it. Because some of the things that are different versus a, say like a Xeon E2400 series or the new Xeon 6300 series is this has more cores. We have 12 cores in only 65 watts. Intel's competitor to this platform is still stuck at only eight cores. And that is just kind of not a lot. Now there are options to get higher core counts. Like you can get 16 core CPUs and we've put those in the system, but we can actually open this up and I can show you a little bit about more about what's in here. Now our CPU in the middle here, that is the one that you can replace and it's absolutely fine at this kind of even open like this. But you're gonna see that we have our memory nexus. Now we have a two 48 gigabyte D color DDR5 DIMMs. That gives us 96 gigabytes of memory. Now we've also tried this with four 48 gigabyte DIMMs for 192 gigabytes of ECC UDIM memory. But either with the 192 gigabytes or this 96 gigabyte configuration, that gives you quite a bit when it comes to if you want to do virtualization or something like that. The other thing though, is that we can also put SSDs in here and quite a bit, even though this is a low cost platform. So you'll see on the front here, we have these two hot swappable SATA bays. Now these are not NVMe, which is kind of a bummer, but this is a low cost server. I totally get it. There's also two more bays and Sam, who is operating the camera, he will tell you that these are much more painful to get installed, 
But on the other hand, if your cost of labor is not very high and you just want to have more SSDs, then this is a good way to go add two more. So we have four, four terabyte or 3.8, four terabyte Micron SSDs in here, and those are SATA SSDs. Then we also have one M.2 SSD over here. So let me just kind of turn this so you can see it. So we have an M.2 SSD, so we have a total of five SSDs. And then there's also a PCIe Gen 5 by 16 slot. So you could actually put like a 400 gigabit NIC in here if you could cool it. I don't think it has really good cooling, but you could uh, do that if you wanted. And the other side is that on the back, you'll see that we have all of our kind of standard features for a server like this. We have our normal like KVM cart IO. Plus we have an out of band management port that we don't have hooked up on set here, but then we also have a two one gigabit port configuration. So you can go and just run one gigabit networking if you want. Now you may say one gigabit networking is not fast. If you do want faster, that's really where you would use the expansion slot. But the other big thing is a server like this is absolutely perfect for low cost co-location. Now, so many times in videos online, everybody just stops when they get to the hardware costs, right? I mean, we have a 12 core processor, 24 threads, and a server that's about $899 to $924. And that would probably be enough, but let's face it, over the last almost 16 years, there are tons of folks that follow STH on the main site or on YouTube that run their own MSP businesses for small, medium business, run IT at large enterprises, all that kind of stuff. And frankly, uh, those folks are not running like Arch Linux and just throwing it on there and doing self-support and that's it. Instead, they're really using a lot of licenses software. And so I think when it comes to virtualization and these platforms, you really have to think about not just the hardware cost, but also some of the software costs. Now that's what we have here. Of course, we're not going to go through hundreds of processors, but instead I picked a couple that I think are really relevant to this discussion. We also have their core counts, their CPU or spec CPU 2017 spec in rate base. We're not going to use peak here, we're going to use base. And so we have that score and then the performance per core, basically that score over the number of cores. And then over here, we have that ideal license. Like what are these different CPUs targeting? And for that, well, let's take a look at some of the common methods. Now, if you're using your server for virtualization, you're probably using some kind of virtualization platform with one of a couple different types of options. Now, these things, number one, change all the time. Uh, you know, this might even be by the time this goes live, this might be out of date. But the other side to it is that there's just tons of different ways you can go do this. So I have a couple of them here. Now, the first one is, of course, if you're doing like the open source, just do it yourself free model, uh, you know, again, that Arch Linux and just supporting it yourself. Well, that's uh, that really doesn't matter, like kind of what CPU you have there. You're really just trying to see how much you can get for your dollar, right? But there are other packages like VMware vSphere and also Red Hat OpenShift where you have a per core licensed and you know they have different minimums and all that kind of stuff, but you really license on a per core basis, in which case you're really just trying to get the most performance per core, not necessarily the most cores in a socket. And there are variations of that. Like for example, when you have license packs, like for example, Windows Server 2025, you're trying to get the most performance per core, but in the constraint of those license packs. So you wanna really maximize how many cores you have or the amount of performance you can get within each license pack that you're purchasing. Worth mentioning here is that Will, who's been a longtime STH main site reviewer, just went through a VMware Exodus project at his day job. There, they went to Microsoft's Windows Server along with the AMD Epic 4004 series because of the license packs. Will, let me give you an example example, since I work at an MSP, Microsoft Windows Server licensing packs require you to buy licensing in 16 core increments. We have purchased many systems based on Epic 4004, in part because the physical core count aligns perfectly with the licensing model offered by Microsoft. In addition to offering higher compute density with Epic 4004 compared to Xeon E, it also feels better to not waste half of our licensing by using a platform capped at eight cores. Of course, this also scales when we deploy larger servers in the data center. There's also per socket licensing. So I have like Citrix and Proxmox VE here. Uh, one quick one on the Proxmox side, you know, somebody's gonna say, well, it's open source software, sure. But if you do wanna get support that is on a socket basis. If you're paying by socket, you of course wanna get the most performance you can in a socket. There are other ones which are some variation of like per CPU pair because we have really commonly dual socket servers. So things like there are some Oracle and Red Hat versions that are like that. And then there are other ones which you know have support or licensing based on the per host cost. So like, that would be like XCPNG or you know other solutions like that. So they're they're just a pretty wide range. And because we have such a wide range of options here, the server processors aren't just based on like, you know, how much performance per core and all that kind of stuff you can get. There's actually kind of a wide range of processors that you can get. 
And so that's why I made this table. We'll let you stop if you really want to go into it. But let me just kind of show you some of this data in a chart format to make it make a little more sense. And so, for example, we're going to take these entry single socket CPUs, really taking that Intel Xeon E2488 because we haven't gotten the slightly higher clock speed Xeon 6300 series. But still, I mean, you're basically at eight cores. AMD and Intel on this are fairly similar. And then when we move to the 12 core, you can see that people just love the fact that you get so much more performance because you get those additional four cores. Now, of course, when you get all the way over to the 16 core CPUs, your performance per socket. So for those licensing models, that's way better. But you're also going to see that like the, the curve is not exactly linear, right? Like we're not getting two X the performance of the eight core CPUs. So that's why we did that division of performance per core. And so this is what that looks like. And again, that 12 core part is pretty popular because not only do you get way more performance than the eight core parts, but you also get significantly more performance per core, making a pretty good mix of both optimizing on performance per socket and per core. Now, of course, I love to put all this in the context of the larger platform. So for example, if you had that HPE DL145 Gen 11 that we just reviewed, you would have something like this AMD Epic 8434P, which is an Epic 8004 Sienna part that uh, you can see is a, is a pretty fast 48 core CPU. And you might ask why we care about this. Let me give you a couple data points. Number one, we get about four times as many cores. So we need four of these low cost servers to equal a single AMD Epic Sienna part. That's in terms of core count, but in terms of performance, it's probably closer to a little over maybe say three X what those servers are, right? So if you're licensed just on a per socket basis, you're way better with a bigger processor. But if you're licensed on a performance per core basis, you might actually be better off with just a higher one, depending on how those per cores are grouped or per core licenses are grouped. But the other thing about 48 cores is it's the same core count as having two Intel Xeon Gold 6252s. Now, these are really important because when we started our cloud native series back in February 2024, I asked Supermicro, I said, hey, like, what is the most popular Cascade Lake SKU that, you know, you guys sold? And they told me it was the Xeon Gold 6252. And if you don't know this in terms of market context, Today, something like half of the servers that are out there in the install base, so installed in data centers today, are either Skylake or Cascade Lake, pretty similar processors for the most part. And so that is a pretty relevant number because if you're going to be replacing a server, well, that's pretty much what you're going to replace. And to give you an idea, those two processors in that server are roughly 2x the performance of the low cost popular server on Newegg. But of course, we have half the cores to be able to do that with the newer generation of processors. And of course, really quickly, if we were to step up to the AMD Epic 9000 series, that's where things get absolutely crazy. For example, we have things like a high frequency 64 core part that's uh, we're going to show you in a sec is actually very similar to the single core parts uh, or single socket parts and a very good reason. But then also uh, you, didn't, you can get a whole bunch more performance by going and getting the giant up to 190 two cores per socket. And just putting this into the context of that 12 core AMD Epic system that we looked at earlier, uh, you know, a 192 core server processor these days is somewhere like 10 X. So you can get 10 of those small servers, or you can just get a single socket server of the big AMD Epic 9000 series now. And of course, if you get a dual socket server, well, then you're talking about more than 20 X. So when people talk about consolidating racks of servers to a single server, that's really what they mean. And of course, consolidating 20 servers down to a single server is exciting. But if you might be saying like, hey, what about the per core performance and per core license costs and all that kind of stuff? Uh, quick thing there, if you have 192 cores, it turns out that your per core performance is actually better than it was on uh, you know, the Xeon Gold 6252. So you're saving money even, even at that like really high core count. But if you were to get that high frequency 64 core part, well, this number right here is essentially the same as those eight core, you know, Xeon-E and also AMD Epic 4000 parts. So this is the kind of crazy thing is like today, not only can you get these like high frequency single socket entry level server processors that have been around for a long time, but you can also scale all the way up into the big sockets and you have so much TDP and, and just resources in those that you can get some performances, essentially the same performance per core, but just scaled up for per socket licensing. So taking a quick step back and why this is absolutely crazy is that if you were to go back to the most popular CPU that Supermicro sold in the very popular generation of Cascade Lake, you have a, just under six as your spec in rate per core, right? And if you were to go to the most popular server right now on Newegg, you're like double that. 
Or another way to look at it, for a lot of folks that are licensing stuff, I mean, you can literally get twice the per core bang for your buck by deploying the most popular server on Newegg with these lower end AMD parts. And that's really just the start because we just saw a whole bunch of things that make this look even smaller. So of course, when we do these, it's not all about the hardware, the software matters as well. And I just wanted to go into that in this video. Now in all of these videos, I like to have a key lessons learned section. I mean, what do we learn from doing this? And my number one thing, and this is something that, you know, we started talking about like last year and we've continued to talk about this year. We've published it on the main site. We've had videos on it. We've had stuff in our newsletters and all that kind of stuff. And frankly, it's just that Intel really needs to redo the whole Xeon E series. I know they rebranded it to the Intel Xeon 6300 series, but that's not redoing the architecture, that's just changing the brand name. And I really think that this Gigabyte server, the number one reason that it is so popular is because, well, frankly, it's actually pretty darn good. It's not super easy to service or anything like that. But on the other hand, if you just wanna go and set up a system, have a little bit of uh, extra time putting it together or whatever, and then you wanna go send it off, you know, it is, frankly works pretty well. It's become one of my favorite systems because that 192 gig configuration with 12 cores, I mean, you know, you're talking about 16 gigabytes of memory per core, right? That's awesome. And of course, because we have SMT, so we have 12 cores and 24 threads in this part, that means that with our 192 gigabytes, we're also getting eight gigabytes per vCPU if we have 24 vCPUs. But also it hits home a little bit more personally because just so you guys know, I actually do have an Epic 4004 series. It's a 16 core part. But the reason that I built one just for myself was because I wanted to have more cores than eight cores. Because at some point, you know, I always wanna run something new on my server and just having more cores means that I can run more than I did on my previous generation servers. And the kind of cool thing about this series is that, you know, you get the Epic processor, you get ECC memory, and at least you know that it's like validated and supported. So it's not that like that Ryzen putting it in the platform and like hoping that ECC works and all that kind of stuff. You just know that, you know, you have an Epic that supports ECC memory. The platform's gonna support ECC memory. And you know the SOC is gonna have things like RAID and all that kind of stuff. So I, I just, for me, this is one of those areas where I just really like these little platforms. And frankly, they're less expensive, so they're a lot more accessible to many folks than some of the higher end systems that we look at. But hey, I'd love to hear what you guys think, so definitely put that down in the comments. Also, if you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends and colleagues, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.